Okay, so this leads us into uh, the circumplex model, which sounds incredibly scientific, but I think you're going to find it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, the circumplex model was designed uh, by three people, uh, Olson, Russell, and Sprinkle. Uh, that last person was actually a professor of mine uh, who passed away just uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, a good man and really insightful about how family relationships worked and his contribution to this model that's used across the world. Uh, was profound to my field. So uh, I like to share it with you. So the circumplex model basically is a grid. Okay, Two axes. I'm going to take you back to high school math here for a minute. You're going to look at, it, look at relationships on these two axes. Uh, the one axis is looking at uh, cohesion. Right? How it is that families connect. Okay? Uh, and you can look at it as a continuum. Okay, so on, on let's say the left side of the continuum, you have uh, families that overconnect, right? We'll, we'll give the specific definition here just in a minute, right? And then you can go along the continuum and you can go to the other extreme, and the other extreme uh, is families that don't connect enough, right? They're too loose uh, in their connection. Right? And so what you want to be as a family in terms of health is to be a family that's right here in the middle that's balanced, right? Has the ability to connect but also the ability to create space in relationships. The other axis of the circumplex model is the axis of flexibility. So with flexibility you uh, have again this continuum where you've got too much and too little. So when you're thinking about the circumplex model, always think the three bears, right? Uh, you know, papa bear is too hot, uh, mama bear was too cold, baby bear is just right, right? So you've got the one extreme of flexibility that's too flexible, right? And these are the, the families uh, where it's just, it's chaotic and messy. Uh, and then at the other end of the continuum, you've got uh, families that are too inflexible, right? And so these are the families that cannot change. It's done the same way every time, regardless of circumstances. And of course, the healthy place to be is right here in the middle, which is balanced, okay? And so in order to understand uh, the circumplex model, you need to understand the continuum, okay? So extremes are bad, uh, balanced is good, okay? So what we're looking for then, when you've got the whole grid, okay, and this is actually something used in a premarital tool called Prepare, uh, when when you've got that uh, when you've got that whole grid, you've got essentially three categories, okay, and so the the three I'm sorry the four corners uh, of the grid are extreme on both dimensions. This is the unbalanced type of relationship. So it's overly connected and overly uh, flexible, right? Or uh, disconnected and inflexible, right? So you've got these four extremes in the corners. Uh, then you've got a second uh, called the mid-range type. And with the mid-range type, essentially what you've got are relationships where you're extreme on one end but not the other. So you might have flexibility, uh, but you're overly connected, right? Or uh, you might have a nice balance of connection and individuality, uh, but you're super inflexible, okay? And then the third uh, type in the grid uh, are, again, clustered around the center, uh, and those are the balanced types. You're balanced on both dimensions. Okay, so you've got those three ranges. So let's talk briefly uh, about uh, each of the each of the different continua, okay, on the axis. So uh, on one axis you've got cohesion, okay. With uh, cohesion you've got the two extremes. So let's talk about the extremes, okay. So on the one end you have too much closeness, okay. This type of relationship 
is called an enmeshed relationship. An enmeshed relationship. So the definition of the enmeshed relationship is these are the relationships where the emphasis is on connection and uh, there is no room for individuality. Okay? The collective is the only thing that matters. These are essentially what I like to call popcorn ball families. Okay? If you've ever seen a popcorn ball and you've tried to take it apart, it's very hard to see where one kernel of corn ends and the other begins. That's an enmeshed family. My identity is fused to the identity of my family. Okay? I don't have an, a, an individual identity that is separate from my family. Okay? So with these kind of families, here are the sorts of things you're going to see. Uh, you are going to see uh, the emphasis on the collective. Okay? You are going to see a lot more of the guilt trips. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be like, well, you want to go to the Art Institute of Chicago, that's fine, but it's going to kill your mom, right? That sort of guilt tripping is going to happen a lot in enmeshed families. Why? Because what you want is secondary to what we want, okay? You're going to see a lot of backdoor politicking and manipulation. Uh, so you're going to see one message up front, but then the other message uh, coming around behind. Uh, that you're going to hear about later. Uh, you're going to see very few boundaries, right? So I am entitled to all the information from your relationship because I'm your family, right? And family is open and honest, right? And so that means that I can ask you questions about your sex life. I can ask you questions about your finances. That that's not your business, it's our business, right? Because if I know what's going on in your relationship, uh, that's what matters because I'm dad or I'm mom and your own individual uh, privacy uh, runs secondary to that, right? Uh, you've also got this collected sense of identity such that if you do something, right, let's say that you decide uh, that you're going to shave your head or you're going to get a face tattoo uh, or, you know, you're going to drop out of Wheaton and, uh, you know, start your own uh, startup. Uh, and I'm going to be mortified by that, and my first response as an enmeshed parent is going to be, how am I going to explain this to my friends at church? Right? It's not, what's best for you? What can I do to think about you? It's going to be, how does this reflect on me? How am I going to feel about this? How is this going to reflect on the family? Right? If you get divorced, uh, think about what that means, right? We don't get divorced in this family. <clears throat> so you, you see a lot of that we think uh, in enmeshed relationships. A lot of the guilt tripping, as I said, a lot of that sense of uh, if, if, if you misbehave uh, or if you do something great, uh, it's a reflection of me. A great television show that's out there if you want to find some clips of it. Uh, is the uh, show called Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh, that's where mom and dad lived uh, right across the street and they came over. They didn't knock, they just walked in. It was such a nice visual example of violation of boundaries. And The wife, Deborah, was constantly throughout the series responding uh, to the parents' violation of, of their uh, privacy or their own family. And uh, there's a great episode where Raymond uh, had, uh, had talked about his uh, journal when he was a kid and uh, that he had a code uh, and the code was, and he was like in elementary school, his code was very uh, complex. It was to take uh, the last letter and put it in the front of the word so that nobody could understand what he was trying to say. And uh, the mother said that uh, she had actually seen his journal and that something that was devastating for her was when he had written in his journal that uh, I e-hat, in other words, hate, my mom. And uh, he, uh, they're having this conversation in her house and uh, he says, wow, I hear how that must have been really upsetting for you. I'm sorry that I did this. And she says, are you really? He says yes, and she goes to this locked drawer, pulls out, uh, pulls open the locked drawer, and pulls out the journal that he had 
when he was 10 years old and makes him write something new about his mother uh, in the journal. That idea of, I can't have an opinion where I'm upset with you, right? I have to resolve that because otherwise it disrupts our relationship. That's enmeshment, okay? They're just messy and dependent, okay? The other extreme of relationships uh, is the uh, not connected enough. These are the disengaged families. Disengagement is defined as an overemphasis on the individual and none on the collective, right? So I don't care about you uh, because I'm me, right? And so disconnected families, they're bumper car families. These are families that might touch every now and again, but there's nothing holding them together. There's no gravitational pull. These are families that do their own thing. These are families that once the kid leaves, they're gone. Uh, there's no expectation that you'll come back for holidays or that you'll come back for a visit. Uh, it's just uh, you do your own thing. And this overemphasis on the individual can also be unhealthy because you don't have that sense of support, that sense of uh, a feeling of us when it comes to family or relationship. And you see couples like this as well, disengaged couples, they're doing separate vacations, they do their own thing, and there isn't that sense of an us uh, with the two of them. You see enmeshed couples as well. These are, there's a, a couple in my high school uh, that we called them Tim and Jeannie, right? Uh, it was not Tim and Jeannie, it was Tim and Jeannie. Uh, because they were essentially one person. Uh, they were fused together, they were constantly hanging on each other, uh, and it was really unhealthy, especially for friends of Tim or friends of Jeannie that used to have a person and now they had this blob uh, instead uh, as their friend. So uh, the, the, in the relationship, disengagement is too much, uh, enmeshment is too much, it's really about finding that healthy balance. And so to illustrate this, I want uh, to uh, illustrate it with three different letters. And we're going to try to do this. I usually have volunteers from my classroom, but this time we're going to try something different. Hold on. Okay, because we do not have uh, classroom volunteers, my children uh, will... Hello, children. Uh, will be the classroom volunteers. They will be illustrating the three different types of relationship. The first will be the dependent relationship. Okay, so uh, face each other. Thank you. Put your hands up though. Okay, and you see they're kind of making an A there. Okay, now uh, Gracie back away. Back away. What happens David? <laughs> it's harder. You're gonna, yeah, and you're gonna fall over, right? Yeah. Okay. That's an issue of the dependent relationship. If one person isn't there, the other person falls over, okay? And that's too dangerous. That's the enmeshed relationship or the dependent relationship. Okay, so now we're gonna make our second letter. Our second letter is an H, and hold your hand straight up. The other hand straight up. See how they're making an H class? Yes, there you go. Okay, now, Gracie, I want you to back away. Oh no. What happened, David? Absolutely nothing. That's the disengaged or independent relationship, the H-frame relationship. David, back away. See what happened, Gracie? Nothing, <laughs> right? She didn't have to move because uh, there is no connection, and this is also unhealthy, okay? Now they're going to make the last one. It's very uh, complex, but do your best. It's the, M fr the M-frame relationship. This is the interdependent relationship, if Gracie can do it. Okay, uh, all right, so Gracie, if you'll step away, and David, just shift forward, see? Shift forward, David. What that Onto your foot. Oh, like, like that? Yeah, just land. Oh. Yeah, see? Uh, with the interdependent relationship, uh, the other person notices a difference. They shift forward a little bit. Uh, but they don't fall on their face like they would in the dependent relationship. So that's the difference between being uh, balanced, that's the M-frame, or interdependent relationship, instead of the enmeshed, which is uh, the A-frame, and dependent, or the disengaged, which is the H-frame, or independent relationship. Thank you, volunteers. I appreciate your help. <laughs> Okay, so that brilliant uh, demonstration of uh, the first dimension of the circumplex model, uh, that of cohesion, 
Uh, it takes us now into the second dimension, the vertical dimension of flexibility. Okay, so with flexibility, like I said, there are two extremes, uh, just like the other. Uh, these are uh, relationships that are too flexible. Those are known as chaotic relationships. And those relationships that aren't flexible enough, those are the rigid relationships. So a, let's start with the rigid. Uh, rigid relationships, uh, that what you see with these types of relationships is you see an overemphasis on hierarchy. All right. So with uh, rigid relationships, you usually have one person in charge, and that never changes. Okay. These families don't adjust uh, to changes in their life. So some of you might have uh, families where uh, you, even though you're college age, are still sitting at the kids table at Thanksgiving or any other family gathering, right? And you don't graduate from the kids table until uh, there is a room uh, made, somebody dies, uh, one of the older relatives uh, dies or is in a nursing home or incapacitated or can't sit at a table, I don't know. Uh, but the kids don't get to move up and stop being kids until uh, there is a space made for them. And with rigid families, that we do things the same way every time, all the time. Uh, it doesn't have the ability to change. These uh, are very brittle families. And so what you see a lot with rigid families is when there is a change, especially if the person at the top uh, dies, the, the person who is the uh, person in charge is the one person that makes all the decision, and all of a sudden they're not there anymore, it creates a vacuum, and these families can frequently fall apart into chaos. Uh, I had one uh, student write a great paper uh, about what happened after her grandmother died. Her grandmother had been the host, the cook, for every family gathering uh, since the time she was born until a couple of years ago. And what happened is when she died, the three sisters, right, the, that family had three daughters, uh, began to fight about who got to host the next one. One uh, sister was the oldest sister, one sister was the best cook, and one sister had the biggest place, right? And so because of this fight, and because no one had ever been part of planning, because grandma had always been the one that planned, no one had been a part of that, the family fractured, and they didn't have Christmas together that year because of it, right? This is what happens with rigid families that are strictly... Uh, you know, by the book, never changing. A good example of this uh, in my own life was a person that I was dating. And uh, she worked at a hospital, and if you don't realize this, hospitals don't close for Christmas. And uh, she was looking to go home to visit her family for Christmas. And uh, the family tradition at home was that you had the big Christmas meal, and then you opened gifts, and then you went, this is all on Christmas Eve, then you went uh, to church for the midnight mass, and then Christmas Day was just kind of relaxed and hanging out. Now these were adult people, there were no kids, so it was really just uh, about this tradition that they'd always had growing up uh, in their family of origin. So anyway, uh, she got her work uh, schedule, and you weren't allowed to shift around schedules at Christmas, and uh, what happened she had to work until 5 o'clock Christmas Eve. So she was going to be able, her, her family lived about three hours away, she was going to be able to get home in time for Christmas Eve service, but unfortunately uh, the meal, she'd missed the meal and she'd missed the gift opening. She called home and was talking to her mom and she says, is it okay if we do the big meal and the gift opening on Christmas Day this year instead of Christmas Eve? I can't get off work. And her mother's response was, I'm sorry, you won't be here. And the message was very clear uh, that the schedule was not going to change simply because one family member couldn't make it. And I oftentimes pictured what this mother would be like if there were a blizzard on Christmas Eve sitting in her house eating the big Christmas dinner all by herself because no one was there. Uh, but that's a good example of rigidity. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got chaos. This is a lack, uh, too much flexibility, I'm sorry. So you've got, on this end, no sense of structure. There's no idea of who's in and who's out, right? Uh, actually, 
one experience I had going back to rigid for just a moment. Uh, one experience I had uh, my first year that I was married. Uh, we uh, we were visiting my wife's parents, and uh, they were going to take a picture by the tree. Let's take a picture by the tree. So we all went over uh, by the tree. Uh, they had the camera. They took the picture. And then uh, my mother-in-law said, okay, now one with just family. And what that meant was, uh, Derek, go sit down. <laughs> uh, because she wanted just family. And even though I was married, uh, I wasn't considered family. Rigid families don't adjust who is considered family. Uh, or they adjust it very, with great difficulty. Chaotic families are the other end of the spectrum. So you've got families where there's no definition. There's like Uncle Bob, and he's not related to anybody, but everybody calls him Uncle Bob, and he comes to every family situation, right? That's a chaotic family, right? Chaotic families have no sense of structure, sense of schedule, right? So you've got families that are celebrating Christmas in uh, November or January. They don't care, uh, and it's, it's not around the date. Uh, but there isn't that sense of maybe they don't even celebrate Christmas because they it slips everybody's mind, right? There isn't that sense of tradition. These are families that are constantly fluid and moving around to the detriment of really understanding who is it that we are uh, based on our traditions. So you've got these two extremes. So uh, when, when you're looking at uh, dysfunction in families, you're looking at those outliers, right? And so you've got rigidly uh, chaotic, I'm, I'm sorry, rigidly enmeshed, right? Or rigidly disconnected or chaotically enmeshed or chaotically uh, disengaged, right? That's, uh, those are the extremes, but most families lie somewhere in the middle. Uh, the example that I give from my family is uh, the first Christmas that I had my wife come to my family and uh, our holiday. And uh, so we got there Christmas Eve, and one of the Christmas traditions in my family is making Christmas cookies. And we always made them on Christmas Eve. And so uh, my mom would spend all day baking cookies. Uh, there were three of us boys and my dad. Uh, and so there wasn't a lot of help in the kitchen for my mom. And so she'd spend all day making Christmas cookies, uh, mixing up uh, homemade icing, and she'd wrap the icing with the you know decorative saran wrap, and she'd lay out all the cookies on the dining table, and then all the little bowls of homemade icing and uh, and the sprinkles. And uh, my job as a kid was always to do the sprinkling as well as my brothers, right? And that job never changed, right? So my family would be towards the rigid end. Uh, not completely rigid, but towards that end on, on the d dynamic of flexibility. And so anyway, uh, when my brother got married, his wife joined in with what the kids do, right? My mom was in charge of baking the cookies, icing the cookies, and then handing it over to us, and we'd sprinkle the cookies, right? And uh, so my wife, it's her first Christmas, and uh, my mom has been baking all day. She's got all the cookies laid out. She's got all the bowls of homemade ice cream, uh, icing with uh, the decorative saran wrap. And, uh, you know, she's like, okay, it's time to make the Christmas cookies. And she goes back into the kitchen. We all go into the dining room, right? And, you know, me and my brother and his wife and my sister all take our seats uh, on the sprinkling side as we should and my wife walks in and she walks to the other side of the table and she grabs one of the bowls takes the decorative saran wrap off uh, grabs a knife and starts icing cookies and my brother and I both had now keep in mind I was 31 my brother was probably around 28 uh, and both of us had the exact same uh, a, a reaction to my wife, which was, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Stop, put down the knife. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Right, we're so nervous. And she's looking at us like we're complete idiots, right? And she's icing cookies. And uh, my mom walks in, right? And it's quiet. And oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? Uh, and my mom looks at my wife, who's icing the cookies, and she goes, oh good, someone else wants to help with the icing. And both of my brother and I had the exact same reaction as well, which was, who are you and what have you done with my mom? 
<laughs> because it wasn't the tradition. But here's how families change, right? It takes one person willing to break the rules in order to create new rules, right? And that's why we're not on the completely rigid end, because otherwise my mom would have said, please stop doing what you're doing, right? Instead, she was open to change. And that's how families adapt and change as new members come in, as old members leave, right? We have to be able to change and adapt and those balanced families find the ability to do so. The rigid families struggle with this. We got to find ways to include new people. The enmeshed families have a hard time doing that. Uh, the balanced families have an easier time doing that. So that's the idea of the circumplex model. Uh, and that sort of wraps up our uh, lecture for tonight. Uh, a couple of things I want you to think about. Think about something that's happened recently with your family, right? A recent tradition, a recent holiday. Where would you put your family on the two dimensions of the circumplex model, right? Uh, where would they be on closeness? Where would they be on flexibility? And then what you can do is take a look, if you're in an intimate relationship at this point, to think about where are we on closeness? Are we gooey, overly close? Are we doing our own thing? Right? And how does that compare uh, to the way my family of origin uh, is designed? Right? Are we similar to the way my family of origin is? Are we completely different? Are we somewhere in between? So think about these things moving forward. Uh, I'll be posting a new video on personality in the coming days, so keep an eye out for that. I'll email the link to you, but it'll also be posted in Moodle. So thanks for being a part of this class. Thanks for being a part of this experience. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm sad that I won't be able to meet you in person, but I'm here as a resource regardless. We'll see you next week.